Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, Adapters. Welcome back to a very exciting episode. Joining me again is Alice Hill at the Council on Foreign Relations. She is out with a new book, The Fight for Climate After COVID-19. The book is just out, and Alice and I take a deep dive on it. We cover her time in the Obama White House working on biodefense and climate change. She has some great stories of working there. We also talk about political leadership and how important it is and will be to get anything done on the climate front. We look to lessons learned in our catastrophically bad response to COVID-19. And we also discuss the notion of marrying climate mitigation and adaptation. These two fields have been doing a bit of a dance lately, and we dig into how they can work more closely together. It's a great episode. You're going to enjoy this. Upcoming episodes, the second in my two-part series with the University of Pennsylvania's Warden Risk Center is coming out, and we dig further into flood risk and our responses to it. Also, the final episode in the Nantucket series and how that island is adapting to climate change. And we have a few other surprises headed your way as we head into the fall season. Okay, let's jump into this conversation with Alice Hill. Hey, Adapters. Today, I have a very exciting episode. I am talking with Judge Alice Hill. Alice is the Senior Fellow for Climate Change Policy at the Council on Foreign Relations. Hi, Alice. Welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Doug. I'm so glad to be able to join you. All right. You are a recurring character in this podcast, so it's always a treat to have you. And we're here to host you. We're, we're, we're going to do something kind of exciting. You're back with a new book. Yes. I'm very excited to have launched The Fight for Climate After COVID-19. Just been released. So we're going to spend this episode digging into that. I have all sorts of questions. It's it's a great book, highly recommend. And I think it's it's getting some really good press. But let's just check in a little bit. How you been? What's keeping you busy? I know obviously the book, but what's what's sort of been on your plate? Well, of course, we've had a very dramatic uh, year with COVID, but also with these climate events that have just brought to the fore the need to adapt. And then just six weeks away is COP26. So lots of focus on what the United States could do to make sure that we have a better handle on our emissions going forward so that we are not as the globe all together, all countries headed over a cliff. Uh, with our emissions, which will make it very difficult to have successful adaptation if we don't rein in these emissions. So let's talk a bit about the origins of the book. And people have been talking since the very beginning of the pandemic about, okay, what lessons can we learn for climate change? But there really, it hasn't been that long. And so the books haven't come out and you're one of the first, if not one of you know the first, and you have a unique background to kind of speak to both topics, but give us a little bit of history on why you decide to write an entire book about it. Well, I had been in the uh, fortunate position of having policy making responsibility for both biological threats, which include pandemics, as well as climate change. And as we saw COVID-19 begin to enter the United States and then begin its spread, I realized that there were deep connections between these two risks that carry untold harm, that it would be helpful to to bring out those risks and find the areas that we can learn from, from the catastrophic risk that is the pandemic, to have a better future when it comes to the catastrophic risk that is climate change. So it was taking that those two experiences and being able to compare and contrast to some extent to how we can do better going forward. So before we dig into, I mean, it's a great book, but I, I have to just thank you for putting me in your acknowledgments. That was such an honor. I just saw my name there and I was just blushing. It was just fantastic. So thank you, Alice. It was truly just a treat to be included in a list of, you know, a lot of really <laughs> amazing people on that list. Well, Doug, I just have to say you are a standout. You have been doing your podcast from the very beginning. We met years ago and your work has been so important for making sure that people understand the issue of adaptation 
and that they remain focused, even though we need, obviously, to cut our emissions to avoid the unmanageable impacts from greater heating, but we also still need to adapt. And you've been so clear on that message, and it's just been a very welcome light in all this discussion to have your podcast that provides reliable, recent, and really important information for all of us to guide our adaptation decisions. All right. Well, Alice, I was very touched. So thank you so much. So let's talk about some of the stories that are in the book. And you were in charge of coming up with an adaptation plan for the Homeland Security Department in 2009. And correct maybe some of those details if I get them wrong. As I was reading that, and you know, you look in hindsight now, it's been enough time. Could you elaborate how you were looking at the science, dealing with some of these panels that were on your team and such, but how are you able to weave in the urgency of the issue? And you know, looking back there, how did that all work? Well, all of us that were on this task force, we were created a task force at the Department of Homeland Security, which has this huge sprawling mandate. It's a very large security agency that has to monitor our borders. It has FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Administration, TSA, Coast Guard, which polices our coastal areas. Looking at DHS and asking the question in 2009, and why were we asking the question? Because President Obama had issued an executive order requiring all federal agencies to engage in adaptation planning. So we were asked the question to the task force that was assembled to examine this issue. What should we do different now in the face of climate change? Do we need to care now as we look at what's ahead? And I don't think any of the members of that task force had a deep understanding of what climate change would mean, what the warming temperatures would do as a result of the carbon pollution that's formed this blanket around our planet. Now we're heating up underneath that blanket. None of us really appreciated how dire those impacts would be. So we were able to consult with leading scientists, and the federal government has some of the best scientists in the world, and meteorologists from the Navy. The Navy had had a very important task force, Navy Task Force Climate Change. We learned from their work. And all of us had what I call a collective aha moment where we realized Climate change affects everything. And I I recall two Coast Guard members who really had been attending somewhat reluctantly this task force. But by the end, they realized, wow, you know, in the Arctic, because temperatures are rising so quickly there, we're going to have a whole ocean open up. And that's going to mean that we're going to have to think differently about how we police that area, ecotourism, more transit of shipping, because it saves about 11 days for China to ship across the Arctic Ocean. And they have begun shipping, which means that goods are cheaper. So that will change Coast Guard. And they also their facilities, which are many of them right on along the coast and vulnerable to sea level rise. So there was for them a moment where they said, oh, actually, this really matters to us. And I I think that's what we all began to realize. And then we could develop a plan for DHS that was quite forward leaning and describing all the efforts that needed to take place to prepare that big, big agency. There's just a lot of these great anecdotes here. And I want you to share the story here. This was so interesting is that you were there briefing the vice president Biden at the time about embedding an office of biodefense within the vice president's office. And then there's all sorts of bureaucratic reasons why this goes here and there. And I think, I mean, the whole point was that you were advising him that, no, it's probably not a good idea to embed it there. And then what unfolded during the Trump presidency? Do you want to kind of elaborate on that? Sure. One of the concerns has always been, are we prepared for really these biological threats? And they can be a pandemic or it could be something like an aerosolized anthrax attack. That's where anthrax would be shot across different areas, and it's very lethal if it's inhaled. So we were looking at all sorts of things, and there had been a number of groups that had been critical of the White House's organization for biological threats, because like climate change, like these many of these interdisciplinary challenges they tend, the organization doesn't keep up with the need to make sure that there is a unity of effort. Instead, the efforts tend to be sprinkled around what historically has already been the existing structure. 
there have been criticism that there needed to be greater coordination. And one of the recommendations that had come forward is that everything should be centered in the vice president's office. And we met with then Vice President Biden, the, the, those of us that were responsible for biological threats in the White House, and uh, talked through that. But it didn't really make sense to put it all in the vice president's office because the vice president has a lot of demands on his or her time. And you, what you really need is an office that is concentrated on that. And, and that's eventually what occurred on the National Security Council. We created a special office. Fast forward during the Trump administration, and unfortunately, the Trump administration chose not to follow the planning that had been put in place really over decades since the mid-1970s, which was a system that uh, planned for coordination among various agencies, established how their, uh, the relationships would work among those and who was which agency was responsible for which. The Trump administration chose not to do that. It actually created two lines of effort, one under the president's son-in-law and one under Vice President Pence. And, you know, we are just past in the United States the or almost passing the number of deaths that occurred in the 1918 Spanish flu. Of course, our population is larger, but that's pretty stunning given the medical and technological advances that have occurred since 1918. So our approach wasn't successful in the initial months for the pandemic. And one of those reasons, I believe, is that they put it in the vice president's office as well as the president's son-in-law's office, and that just created confusion and cut off all those relationships that have been built over 30 years building the nation's pandemic preparedness plans. One of the big lessons in all of this, and that this is true for climate change, is leadership matters and making sure that you have the right organization and that the people who are asked to do these things have the necessary tools and background and understanding of what exists that they can use as a resource to have a, make sure that they have a better outcome with the challenge. All right. I'm going to come back to leadership a little bit later, but I just, it, it was a fascinating story. And like most of us, oh, it's the vice president's office. Well, that must mean it's important, but I'm a, I'm a bit of a bureaucracy junkie. I worked in the federal government, state government, and they can work really poorly if you don't really understand how they operate. And you were really just in this unique position, setting up some of the earliest adaptation work within Homeland Security and then the, the National Security Council. But then I didn't realize your background there too. And in biodefense, are you seeing anything in the Biden administration when it, I guess, focusing more on the climate change side, like, all right, they've placed this here. That's not, that's a sign that it's not getting this necessarily attention it deserves. Cause I mean, you obviously were a master bureaucrat. Hopefully you won't take that as an insult and understand how all these kind of pieces work together and when things are prioritized and budgeted for. What, what are you kind of seeing right now? Well, look, we've never had an administration more focused on climate change than the Biden administration. So they deserve a lot of kudos for the multiple lines of effort that are taking place right now to address uh, both the emissions as well as the resilience side. Uh, we have a effort in Congress that has been pushed by the Biden administration that could bring more dollars to climate than the nation has ever had. It'll be a wonderful start for what we need to do in this country. I have been on record that uh, one piece that's missing, I believe, in the Biden lineup is a national adaptation strategy. Planning matters. It was a former President uh, Dwight Eisenhower, who obviously uh, led Allied troops during World War II, who famously said that plans are useless, but planning is essential. And what he was getting at is that planning steeps those decision makers in the actual problem, helps them build the relationships and the understanding that can be more lasting, and then uh, help make sure that everyone's headed in the same direction. You may not ultimately follow the plan to the letter, but at least that's setting the framework. And until we get that kind of framework here in the United States, the Government Accountability Office has basically said that we're just going to do lots of little projects that really won't add up to the kind of adaptation that's required for the types of events that we will experience, even if we were highly successful in cutting our emissions. 
So we need a national adaptation strategy, and we haven't seen that come out of the uh, Biden administration yet. Such a strategy would allow us to prioritize our investments, set some kind of metric for measuring whether we're being successful, you know, what you measure gets managed uh, and would allow us to to define what the role is of the federal government vis-a-vis the private sector, state, local, tribal governments. All of those issues need to be thought through and then provide guidance about how the federal government can best support decision makers on the ground who are have to decide Is it a seawall? Is it rebuilding the coastal marsh system? Is it raising houses? Is it managed retreat? Is it all of the above? Uh, But until we get that kind of national strategy, it's hard to set a framework for everyone to see themselves within. Okay, related to that, I just want to read back a bit of a quote from your book. And you write, a clear national vision that seeks coordination among internal and international partners in this referring to local adaptation. Local adaptation risks becoming a series of Band-Aid fixes with no lasting power. And so even though this was maybe in the context of international sort of cooperation, what you were just describing national, there's been such a focus on adaptation being a local issue, but you're arguing a national plan will help just provide sort of metrics and, you know, even resources for the local people actually doing the adaptation. So there, it's, it's kind of mixed messaging that's out there right now. What do you think? Absolutely that climate change is local, but climate change crosses all of our jurisdictional boundaries that humans have so carefully crafted over the years. And uh, in the United States, there's something like 90,000 different jurisdictions from a school district to the state, local to tribal to the federal government. And these impacts cross all of those lines. So if you have each little district or each little jurisdictional entity making their own decisions on upstream, for example, town making a decision about water flow, which will deeply affect the downstream neighbor, but they don't consider that neighbor really a hot mess. It just doesn't work. Yes, we will need to make these decisions locally, but we need to make them in coordination with each other and find ways to work across borders because the borders get ignored by whether it's a pandemic or it's a storm. It just sweeps through. So we need to figure out how to plan together and a national plan would help promote that so that we can make sure that both communities, all communities are safe in the face of these growing risks. Do you think the national regulatory infrastructure is set up? Is it good enough to start incorporating adaptation planning? You know what I mean? Like NEPA, there's a lot of water laws and air laws. That's an infrastructure of regulation. Do we need more? Or is that something you got to get to ponder within the book? I think we need some regulation in some space. One area that I talk a lot about is building codes and land use. Because right now we have a system that creates a moral hazard for local communities who want to maintain their tax dollars and their tax base to allow for development that doesn't use strong building codes and that occurs in areas at risk. You know, we've had more development in areas at risk for flooding than not in recent times. And we've seen an explosion of development in areas that are at high risk of wildfire in this area called the wildland urban interface, where people build homes next to grasslands or right next to the forest or in the middle of the forest. And then we see much higher incident of wildfires, bigger wildfires, hotter wildfires. So we're seeing a lot of destruction. Those are land use and building decisions that are at the local level. So the federal government could do a lot more. Regulation would be, and that would be, in my mind, that regulation for land use and building codes would be for making it clear that no more federal money will go into these areas unless it's done, the development is resilient, uh, if that's what the money is going to be used for. And then regulation in the private sector to force disclosure of climate risk. Uh, It was Nicholas Stern, an economist from the United Kingdom, who first identified climate change, at least publicly, as the largest market failure ever. And one of the things we're seeing is that many corporations, FM Global has stated that the vast majority of corporations do not yet uh, understand or account for their climate risk in their own planning. 
So we need to change that. And we need to have very rapid change and regulation would help that. At the end of the day, the goal has to be that all of these decisions consider future climate risk. And so that's what a national plan would also encourage is incorporation of consideration of future risk when you're making any major investment, any land use, building decision, and also drive this consideration in the private sector as well. This is probably a question you're going to love. And I think of 2021, Alice Hill, one of the leading voices on the adaptation space. I mean, (laughs) I'm guessing you would agree with me that you you today are much different and you know a lot more than you were back in 2010, 2009, when you were doing those sort of things. What would 2021 Alice Hill, in hindsight, if you were back developing those plans at Homeland Security, or even when you were on the National Security Council, how would you have done things differently? Or would you have? Have you thought about that? No, what a great (laughs) question. Uh, I think that's a very interesting question. The thing that leaps to mind is to treat adaptation and mitigation, the cutting of emissions, uh, using the term mitigation to mean that, treat them as a whole rather than as separately. Now, I came into the climate change challenge from the adaptation side. I didn't really start with the cutting emissions side. And when I started in adaptation, Doug, you probably can appreciate that. There weren't that many people in this field. So there was a great deal more space in the mitigation of emissions. There were many who'd been working for many years to get get focus on that and to improve. But the challenge is, I don't think I appreciated how important treating both of those together was because the ultimately the best adaptation strategy is to cut our emissions, even though we're not going to be able to avoid a lot of these impacts just because of that delayed element of heating from the blanket. It's kind of like you're, when you were a little kid and your mom came in and put a blanket over your bed and you woke up and you were really hot, you know, there's just going to be a delayed impact because it's slow to heat up. And that will occur even if we cut off any additional emissions to that blanket. And I just didn't appreciate how we needed to communicate those two things together because we're right now at a point where we may, unfortunately, all nations together go over a cliff uh, and enter a world where the heating in some years hence will be completely unmanageable and there'll be adaptation that will be very hard to handle. If you just think about migration, the numbers of people on the move You know, at first it was 140 million by 2040. Those numbers keep getting increased. And we just look at our southern border with immigrants, uh, migrants from Central America and Haiti. These are really what Alexander Betts, one academic, calls survival migrants. They're just, their countries have been so hard hit. They're trying to find another place to go where they can have safety and more security. And we'll, we will see those numbers grow. So we need to cut our emissions and and adapt, and and we need to work together. It's a, it can't be as it is right now a somewhat separated discussion. So I wish I had appreciated that more, and I would have been more consistent in bringing that in. I think I've improved over time as my understanding has improved. But these are conjoined issues that suffer if they're treated separately. Uh, And there's more reasons than I've shared why that occurs, but it is a risk that we create by treating them as separate lines of effort. So you have a whole chapter called Mary Mitigation and Adaptation. And I was just, I got to that. I'm just, all right, this is going to be good. Because I I don't know if you've been following, you know, Twitter's a a good place to kind of keep your finger on the pulse of a lot of these different voices. And there there seems to be, we we thought we put behind us that if you're in the adaptation space, you somehow are giving up on mitigation. I thought we put that behind us, but it seems to be rearing its its ugly head again. You know, even there was a sort of sub conversation I was part of, and I'd be curious what you think of this is that, this person was talking about some local decision in Louisiana where they were developing an adaptation plan, sort of uh, not the county, what do they call them, Louisiana? They call them the uh, uh, Cajun name or something. Anyway, just a local government unit. And they were talking about developing an adaptation plan, but he was arguing that they also had an opportunity to talk about reducing their carbon footprint in this coastal Louisiana parish. And he was saying adaptation is a waste of time if you're not also doing that. And I just, I just, 
disagreed. Even though I would like that local parish to think about decarbonizing their local economy, they're still having to climate proof that coastal community and adaptation planning. There are going to be different people involved with that. And so I'm seeing more of this. And I'm just curious your thoughts of they don't always have to kind of work in tandem. You just sometimes adaptation has nothing to do with mitigation. Uh, I would agree with that. So I, I appreciate the person on Twitter's desire to maintain the focus on cutting emissions, but it's going to depend on the adaptation choice. There could be huge winners. You know, you think of natural infrastructure, which if you look at mangrove forests, I think they are absorb 10% of the carbon. And they also act as a buffer when there's a big storm surge, when there's flooding. So restoration of mangrove forests is a win-win. It's a win for adaptation and it's a win for mitigation. So we should be looking for those. But sometimes our mitigation choices can result in maladaptation and vice versa. So one example of that would be a complete reliance on solar can make you vulnerable to having to use more diesel fuel generators or powering up essentially mouthballed fossil fuel plants because you can't generate enough solar power. And that is a risk when you have wildfires. You know, all that ash comes down on those solar panels and it causes dramatic dips in the production of power just when people want a lot of power. So that we need to think through going forward. And then on the flip side, on adaptation, you could have mal-mitigation. I remember vividly, we were trying to work in the White House on ways to protect access to fresh water. And I'm sitting around a conference room in the old executive office building, which that is that wedding cake-like building right next to the White House and huge conference table. And we're all leaning back, trying to brainstorm, what can we do about making sure that we continue to have access to fresh water? And somebody says, oh, desal. And let's do more desal. And desal is desalination. It's used widely around the world. In fact, it's mushroomed uh, in recent years. A lot of Middle East countries use it. But desalination is very power intensive. So if you're not thinking through that you want to use clean energy for that purpose, you are really at risk of shooting up the emissions as you're trying to solve your access to fresh water problem. We need to think through these things and work together and not treat them as if they are separate and that somehow people who work on one or the other are tainted by that choice. It's all integrated together. And the more we treat it as integrated, the better we will have in our outcomes. You know, Saudi Arabia devotes 25% of its domestic oil and gas to desalination plants. So if we try to get that down, right now it's only 1% from uh, renewable sources for desalination plants, it would make a big difference. And that's where we can work together, for example. Well, it got me thinking just like if as we come up with metrics, how we decide to sort of make uniform adaptation practices out there, like the notion of is every adaptation action carbon neutral? And I mean, quite honestly, that's just the, that would seem very impractical. And you're probably look, you could paralyze a lot of work. But I, I mean, I appreciate that you certainly desalinization. I would hope you don't want to de- burn fuel, but even at a small a seawall is a carbon neutral. I wonder if we're headed that way, thinking sort of at that scale, if we are marrying those two topics, I, I'm I'm on the fence. I'm I'm interested in how those conversations unfold as we really start upscaling a lot of adaptation work. Well, the important takeaway for me is that we have the conversation and we recognize that there are two goals here, cut emissions plus protect people and property. And as we discuss these things, we need to think, can we achieve both goals, have a win-win, which is the best? And if we can't, what are the trade-offs and what are the costs? And does it make sense to have much greater emissions by building a seawall than having a natural solution? Or is it better to try to have the natural solution, even though it might not give you as much protection, uh, to avoid the emissions from the concrete? But what we want 
to avoid is making decisions that don't consider the greater vulnerabilities from climate change. And that would be, for example, continuing to build in high in areas that are at high risk of fires without changing our building practices, because that means we will have poured all that new concrete, all those emissions, all those things. And even if we have a really energy efficient home in those wildfire areas, if we haven't thought about wildfire, we've just contributed to the problem. So you'd mentioned about leadership earlier, and I said I want to come back to it. And obviously, I mean, my opinion, the, the response to COVID was catastrophic, and we're still dealing with that. And then how we apply those lessons to climate change and the idea of what is good leadership, how can someone sort of seize the mantle and just lead on these issues? And I and, and I was a somewhat young, but I remember it is when Reagan in the Montreal Protocol, the scientists came out really quickly talking about the hole in the ozone layer and these things in the refrigerators are causing it. We need to act really quickly. And it just seemed like the international community came around really around it. The press was there, but it didn't seem like it got out in the public realm. Like, okay, we don't really need to hear from you. We are just going to respond very quickly. And Reagan, he did, you know, they signed the Montreal Protocol. And I think, knock on wood, that's been a big success story. You don't necessarily always have to bring the public along when it's these really important big decisions. And I'm just curious, do you think there's any lessons to be learned in what happened there to climate change, to COVID? Absolutely. It's one of the most successful multilateral treaties in this space in a in forever. And you point out some important aspects. I had the great honor and pleasure of working with George Schultz. He was, I believe, a secretary to maybe four presidents and mm-hmm. held four different secretarial positions. And he was the chief negotiator of that. And speaking with him, he identified Reagan's support of it is very important to his ability to be able to negotiate this successfully. Reagan recognized the problem, uh, according to Secretary Schultz, and then acted on it. Other things that were in favor was it was uh, one discrete problem versus trying to address so many problems with climate change. There's so many sources of emissions And I think what made it easier was also people could visualize what was at stake. It's a hole in the ozone and that that you could just see that. Climate change feels a little more amorphous and it just makes it harder uh, to have people grasp. But it was a, I believe, two great leaders working on that, probably more, but certainly President Reagan in terms of his his willingness to push that issue right then showed very strong leadership. And George Schultz, as a master negotiator, took that that direction from the President Reagan and made sure he drove it home. And he was just a, a master diplomat. So he was able to do that successfully. Well, and again, it's these systems you have to count, I guess, one person. And I guess, what if President Reagan had said, you know what, this is just junk science, or my corporate folks are saying this is all baloney, and he was not fully on board, would we still be dealing with the ozone issue? Or would it have been just such a critical one that the very next president would have done something? But it just did having that decision-making power and being supportive. I guess my point is just, I don't think the public was necessarily, I don't think Reagan was there thinking, we've got to bring the public along for this. And I know you just described climate change, it's much more complex, but it's just the, the idea of this decisive leadership being able to tackle these big problems. And I haven't quite seen that on the climate change issue yet. Well, it's a real challenge. Climate change, it's nuanced and certainly understanding it can be a challenge. And we haven't done a very good job on two fronts. First, educating people about it. We're graduating still many who don't understand climate change. It's not included in core curricula. Many uh, universities of a some eager 17-year-olds typing into their search engine for some university climate change. It doesn't pop up. Here's this course of study that you follow to really know what the issues are around climate change. In fact, I've been part of a group that's been trying to get medical, nursing, public health schools to make it part of their core curriculum, the effects of climate change, because of course, climate change, heat, flood spread diseases, 
vector-borne diseases, mosquitoes, ticks, all change their geographical location as a result of heat. Algae, we have far more harm caused by new water diseases. So getting those schools to teach this has been really an uphill climb. Every university student just a couple of weeks ago finally told their school, you know, we're medical students. We need to have this in our core curricula. And I will credit Emory University administration. They said, you're right. And they made it part of the core curricula. But that's kind of where we are with a lot of schools. They've been slow to set the path to educate people to what's ahead. And and then if there's a lack of appreciation, I think the human brain tends to discount the threat because... It's so unfamiliar and we assess catastrophic risk based on our experience or the experience of our loved ones or our friends. And so this is an unfamiliar risk that's really big. And so we think, oh, it won't happen to me. And it's just not that bad. But education could help with that. And just so that, you know, just wrapping up this issue of leadership too. And one of the quotes that you have from a preparedness expert, he says, or she says, if a president chooses to ignore advice, it doesn't really matter how you organize. And there was a whole discussion about all the planning and a lot of really great things. And I think a lot of this had to do with uh, the biodefense, but somewhat with climate change and basically saying if that person at the top just dismisses this, then all that great and effective planning doesn't really mean anything. And and my sort of follow up to that is the military, or I mean, you're, you were in the National Security Council. Aren't people scenario planning out when someone at the top doesn't go along with the decision? Aren't there ways that an educated society can even get around poor decision making by someone at the top? And I know I'm being very naive here, but it's just too much is at stake. And I imagine the military has a scenario plan for so many different factors. So why don't we have that in, in regarding some of these issues? Well, I think it depends on who the leader is. And you can take the military. I don't think the military has yet a good grasp on climate change. And I say that because I think under President Biden, they were working very hard to advance. But when you had President Trump saying it's a hoax and the military is a very hierarchical organization, you're not going to have people who are making their careers on through a hierarchical organization begin to focus all their attention on something that the leader doesn't believe is worthy of attention. So in fact, when I was at the in the Obama administration, I worked with the intelligence agency and the military, uh, and I became concerned that neither of those agencies were seriously engaged on climate change. Uh, as a result of many conversations, I eventually developed a executive order on national security and climate change, which President Obama did sign. President Trump revoked that, which is a strong signal. Don't be working on national security and climate change. And now President Biden has brought that order back and they've re- uh, begun those efforts to make sure that all of our national security planning strategies takes into account climate change. But I will tell you that in the mid-level of the military, I have encountered resistance to the linking of climate change to national security. You know, one uh, mid-level career person said, I I understand what you're saying, ma'am, when I was talking to him about national security and climate change. But my job is to figure out what hill to take or who to shoot. And what does that have to do with climate change, essentially, was his question. We need a lot of work to to have people understand the reason we need to care about this is because as more disasters occur, it weakens governments, it weakens societies, and that the weakening provides an opening for terrorists, insurgents, uh, criminal networks to take advantage of the weakness of those governments to expand their territories, to recruit. You know, during the pandemic uh, in Yemen, some Islamists we're recruiting with the slogan, it's better to die a martyr than to die of the pandemic. And meanwhile, in Mexico, El Chapo's daughters were, former head of the Sinaloa cartel, were passing out boxes with pandemic supplies with El Chapo's face stamped on it, signaling, hey, the cartels are here to help you. Your government's not, so we're going to help you. And of course, that makes it much more 
that's highly destabilizing for not only the particular community, because you now have bad actors gaining influence, but also globally, it can be destabilizing because terrorists can be empowered and they can hurt the United States, as we all too well know. So Alice, an area that I try to encourage a lot on the podcast and I'm just fascinated with, and I talk about it, is just this emerging profession of being like an adaptation professional. It's an emerging field. Not everyone necessarily agrees like, oh, well, you're in adaptation. You, you were just doing what you're doing prior and you're working on some climate change. I didn't necessarily see that in the book. And I just, I want to get your thoughts now. I mean, you have now been exposed to in the last three, four or five years, just when you're in the private sector, there are adaptation people kind of coming out of the woodwork and you get invited to come speak to these folks. What are your thoughts about this emerging area? Well, I think you've said it. It's an emerging area. We're identifying much greater need for expertise in this area. And as we see that, we're going to have a better definition of what is an adaptation professional. What are the requirements? What are the expectations? Right now, we have an arms race going on among consultancies and private firms for modeling, for advice on how to adapt, for really work in this field. But there's no clear definition of what's required or what's needed. I think it's an evolution. And we will see that certain skills, economic, maybe engineering, it could be communication skills that help communities understand and speak with stakeholders what's what they need to worry about. It's going to be architects, it's public health professionals, but all of them, there'll be greater understanding of what it takes to adapt and what we need, qualities we need in the professionals who are going to do this work of adaptation. It's absolutely clear we need good communicators on risk, and we need a whole suite of climate services for everyone to use, and that's going to require adaptation professionals to inform the choices that the local communities need to make, hopefully in collaboration with their adjoining communities, so it crosses all borders, that will inform those choices. So I want to bring this back around to COVID and climate change. And just when you look at what happened, first of our initial response was just terrible. But then in the last six months, we've had the rise of this anti-vaxxer movement, and which is very disturbing. How did that influence your thinking? And did much of that, because some of that's all just happening in real time as we speak, did that make it into the book? And what are your thoughts on this kind of movement and misinformation, how that makes dealing with climate change that much harder? Well, there's great parallels with this. We've had a lot of misinformation about climate change. We've had uh, downplaying of the risks. We've had our economic models didn't really reflect what was at stake. So people could think that it wouldn't be as dire and with charge that people who worried about it, like me were alarmists. But the same is happening here. It's misinformation, uh, not understanding how decisions in one area affects another. Some communities decide not to mask up means that other communities may pay a higher price and points out just how challenging it is to be a good leader in these circumstances, but how important it is to follow the science be straightforward and make sure that we are making decisions that reflect what's really at stake and say challenge for anyone. But we can learn a lot from what we've seen with the pandemic to try to make sure that we are educating people to what's ahead and, and meeting them where they are to communicate honestly about climate change. Okay, so Alice, what's next for you? And a lot of times when people are writing a book, they're already getting their idea for the next book or their next big project. So what's in store for you? Well, most immediately is COP26, trying to understand what will come out of that event, because that will have grave implications. Uh, hopefully they're good implications, but very serious implications for whatever comes next with climate change. If the nations of the world don't come together with far greater ambition about what's to be achieved, it will change the thinking on adaptation and really the thinking about what the global world situation will be um, because we will have a 
deeper division between the developed world and the developing world. And that could have grave consequences as well for global stability. So that's my most immediate, but I love working on adaptation. So I am thinking through some possible new book projects on uh, really focusing on what works. And I think those are questions that we need to answer. We don't want every community, every local decision maker to have to reinvent the wheel. There are a lot of good ideas, but what's happening is there isn't an easy place to share those ideas. So that's, I'm trying to think through what would that look like and hopefully be a part of it. Okay. You've answered this before, but it's a little bit more targeted. So if you could recommend someone to come on the podcast, who from the book, who a figure or someone that was mentioned in the book, would you recommend to come on the podcast? I would recommend Tom Bostic. He was the former head of the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, and he has thought deeply about adaptation through the mission of the Army Corps of Engineers, which is a lot of uh, how we build our levees and how we deal with water. But he's thought a lot about also how to prioritize things. He describes our current method of of spending money on things like adaptation as just spreading a thin layer of peanut butter across a piece of bread instead of figuring out what would be the most effective way to go forward. So he is a, a very knowledgeable and just a delightful person on this. He gave me one of the biggest insights, uh, so basic. He said, look, when we build infrastructure, it's usually better if it lasts longer. And that's particularly important when it comes to climate change, because if you don't think about the future risk, the bridge is probably going to collapse under future flooding. And we look at the Romans. Romans were able to build bridges that last for thousands of years. We still have some 900 of them extant today. And we should be thinking through how can we build infrastructure that will last not only the next 50 years, but for many, many generations going forward. All right. Great recommendation. Alice, always a treat to get you on. I want to just tell my listeners, we barely scratched the surface what's in this book. Just a very readable book. And what I really enjoyed too is that adaptation is this new area and how people frame it, how they put it in context, how they structure it is still a work in progress. And I think your brain thinking about this issue, I think the book really does a nice job of putting some contours around the the field. And I think that's really important at this stage because we're still kind of figuring things out. So I highly recommend you guys check this book out. And again, we just scratched the surface on it. But Alice, again, thanks for coming on. Oh, thank you, Doug. What a wonderful discussion and just love your podcast. Okay, Adapters, that is a wrap. Thanks to Alice Hill for coming on. Alice is truly a regular guest on the podcast. It's such a treat to have her on. I was digging through my archive, and it's been over four years since she first came on to talk about national security. In these past few years, it's been inspiring to watch Alice become one of the leading adaptation and resilience voices. And she's just a very positive presence in our profession. Definitely check out her book. Links are in my show notes. Our discussion around leadership got me thinking about what I want to do for a future episode. I've worked in several places where a single leader leader made all the difference in making big things happen. When it happens, that's a great thing. But if there isn't a leader stepping up, then things can't get done or we don't take the risks we need to tackle big issues like climate change. Our discussion on how the Trump administration handled COVID is a perfect example. All the great planning in the world won't mean a thing if you can't get it out there. If you have ideas around adaptation and leadership, send me a note. I'll be pondering the topic in the meantime and figuring out what a useful episode might be in this space. Hey, I like to thank listeners when they reach out. So big thanks to Rad Cunningham for reaching out. Rad works for the State Department of Health for Washington State in the Climate and Health section. Rad was suggesting a potential guest, which I encourage you guys to do. Thanks, Rad. Rad has been a longtime listener, and apparently he's been encouraging his staff to listen to the podcast. Nice work, Rad. Make it a requirement for their performance evaluation. Okay, just kidding. But seriously, Rad, I'm sure the Pacific Northwest heat wave was a huge issue for your team. And I'm sure you guys are trying to get your head around how to deal with the future with rising temperatures. For those regions not used to dealing with extreme heat, it'll be interesting to learn what approaches you bring into this space. Good luck. Some final housekeeping. 
If you're interested in highlighting your adaptation work in a podcast, consider sponsoring a whole podcast episode of America Adapts. Sponsoring a podcast allows you to focus on the work you're doing and and sharing with climate professionals around the world. So, for example, University of Pennsylvania, the Ward Risk Center, sponsored me to do some episodes around flood risk where we recruited some really excellent speakers around the subject. So basically, they are sponsoring an entire episode to share their particular story. I've done this with various groups like WWF, World Wildlife Fund, UCLA, Harvard, University of Florida, and some other nonprofits. I'm about to start a multi-series episode with NRDC. It's a chance to share your story with all my listeners. Most projects have communications written into them. Consider budgeting in a podcast. Podcasts have a long shelf life much more so than a white paper or a conference presentation many groups work into their communication strategies. So please consider it. We'd have fun. Tell your story. Also, if you're interested in having me speak at a public or corporate event, please reach out. Folks, I speak a lot and you will enjoy it. I've been doing some keynote presentations and they are a lot of fun. I share stories from the podcast and my own personal experiences working in adaptation. I will talk about it in ways that will motivate you and inspire you. You can reach me at americadapts.org. My contact information is there. On that note, I love hearing from you. Sort of like Rad reached out. I mean it. Just say hi. If you have an idea for a guest, let me know. It is the highlight of my week when I have something in my inbox. Someone who's been listening to the podcast and they have some ideas or just some feedback. I'm at americadapts at gmail.com. Send me an email. Might even do a plug for you. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time.